Hello and welcome to Your Damn Jets. Uh, today what I have in mind is not the usual feature. I'm going to be talking about uh, my primary CNS lymphoma. Um, I have cancer and uh, I think there's, there are lessons to be learned from uh, my uh, experiences through the medical system and how to deal with uh, uh, chronic illnesses. So uh, my goal is to be helpful to uh, other patients if I can uh, and, and hopefully uh, give them an idea of uh, how to deal with the healthcare system in the US. So this is going to be a multiple episode series because my story is very long and it's uh, rather complicated. But in the introduction, I'm going to give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, first of all, I'm a regular guy. I've never worked in the nuclear industry. I didn't work with uh, special chemicals. There's no history of lymphoma in my family. I've known some folks who, had, you know, like their siblings have all gotten lymphoma and they've also gotten lymphoma. There's nothing like that in my family. My father does have prostate cancer, uh, which is completely unrelated to lymphoma. It's a completely different cancer. Uh, and it's under control and he's still alive and uh, he's doing well right now. Um, you know, so why did I get a lymphoma? Stuff happens. Uh, nobody can tell me uh, the reason. You know, you can pinpoint the reason why did, why did you, did you get a lymphoma. And I have to also think... Uh, you know, I've been I've been two years now in the, the lymphoma world, figuring out, you know, my place and other people's place in that world. And a lot of people's are, a lot of folks are younger than I am. And why did they get the lymphoma? Uh, a lot of them they're not they're you know just starting college or in college, and so you know they didn't all work in the nuclear industry or in, with dangerous chemicals uh, so you know stuff happens um, my own lymphoma was um, it's a primary CNS lymphoma so in, in, in it can be shortened to PCNS lymphoma or it can be expanded to primary central nervous system lymphoma so my lymphoma was in the nervous system specifically it was in my brain and more specifically was in the brainstem, which I think is somewhere down towards the neck. <laughs> um, PCNS lymphoma is very rare. Um, there are 1,500 people a year in the United States that get that disease. So lymphoma itself is not super rare, but the PCNS lymphoma is one of those um, lymphoma types and there are a few lymphoma types that are very rare but the PCS lymphoma is, is one of those rare types and uh, yeah so I know only of two other people who've had it one person was provided to me by the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society as a peer so they sought somebody who had a PCNS lymphoma who was about my age and had similar condition and put me into contact with that person. And the other person that I know who has a PCNS lymphoma um, is the mother of somebody on a support forum uh, who, who happened to have that kind of lymphoma. And other than that, if I go into lymphoma forums and I talk to other people, or observe what's going on there. A lot of the other people have other types of lymphomas. It's very different from the PCNS lymphoma. Um, so, well, at least I hope what I'm going to say is going to be helpful to people who may have uh, a PCNS lymphoma if it's not useful to other people. But I think some of the lessons that I've learned are good lessons to learn in general. It's not just like you have a PCNS lymphoma, here's what to do. It's, it's more general, more general health issues, um, uh, how to address them and how to address them differently than I've been addressing them in the past. Um, so in brief, my story, you're going to have the low down later in the other episodes, but in brief, I was, I had symptoms. The symptoms started when I was 47. I'm 49 now. 
The symptoms started when I was 47. Uh, I was diagnosed at age 48, and there were several months between the start of the symptoms and the diagnosis. Um, and I had the chemo, and I had a stem cell transplant, and right now I'm recovering from the stem cell transplant, and I'm doing well by all measures. Um, I think I'm doing well. My doctors tell me I'm doing well, so... Uh, right now we're happy. I had a, my last uh, MRI was on December 31st, the last day of last year, <laughs> um, and uh, you know there's there's nothing. They cannot see any disease uh, in the brain, uh, so that's what we want. Uh, all my treatment happened uh, during the pandemic, uh, which was not ideal. For two reasons, one is mentally. It it did the the pen the strain of the pandemic did whack me mentally, and it didn't help that I had health problems at the same time, and part of it has to do with the fact that my wife is older than I am, and I see myself as her protector, and then the lymphoma stole that from me. It's like no, you cannot protect her. She's going to have to protect you, <laughs> um, and that was a tough pill to swallow. Uh, the other thing is that for a good deal of my treatment, my wife could not be with me in the hospital. So for, for my chemo, I had to be admitted every two weeks for about four days. And every, for every admission, I had to be in the hospital by myself. So my wife was driving me to the hospital, was dropping me off there. I was going to get my chemo. And then four days later, she was coming back to take me from the hospital and, and get me back home. Uh, and that was not ideal and not fun. Um, but during the stem cell transplant, um, I, which I did at a different place and I got my chemo, um, the rules were, were at that time relaxed and my wife was able to be there uh, every step of the way for the stem cell transplant, which helped uh, tremendously. Um, and other than you know the, the the pandemic and the presence or absence of of her at the hospital, uh, I have to say my wife has been a tremendous help throughout this whole process. Where she had to step up and take care of the house and take care of you know things that were broken or find solutions, uh, sometimes temporary solutions. But she did step up um, to take care of things that I couldn't take care of because I was not I didn't have the energy or the capability to do it um, so things that helped uh, I can mention my wife um, that helped a lot and took care of, of things here and made me meals and, and, and did a lot of stuff for me that I couldn't do uh, another thing that helped and it was you know, mentally um, I found um, a, a song by um, First Aid Kit, which is called My Silver Lining. Um, and um, yeah, that was a theme song of my, uh, of my treatment, of my chemotherapy and, uh, and of my stem cell transplant. And uh, I invite you to listen to it. I'm going to put the link in the description and also in the video uh, for you to easily find it. Uh, so that helped mentally. Another thing that helped mentally was uh, the uh, Kotaro and Hana were uh, their otters, uh, and they live in Japan. And while I was having my uh, transplant, I, by chance, I stumbled upon their videos and I started watching them, and uh, I find them. Uh, very funny and uh, very heartwarming uh, and this was also a good uh, mental help uh, during my recovery and the uh, people who produce their videos they produce videos regularly so uh, it was useful yeah and lesson the lesson lessons learned so I'm going to have lessons learned in a, just about every episode of the series um, the overall lessons learned 
Well, first, while my wife is able to step up and take care of the house and things are not going to uh, fall apart if I can't uh, be available. But other lessons are that quality care matters. And with the lymphoma and going through the process and being diagnosed and everything, I've fired just about every doctor that saw me before the lymphoma because I don't think they were doing a great job and I'm going to explain why in later videos but I fired them and quality care does matter and where we are here um, the local hospital is not great by any means uh, my treatment for chemotherapy was done at Johns Hopkins which is a great place and my long-term care is again done at Johns Hopkins. And in the meantime, when I had the stem cell transplant, it was done at UMMC, also in Baltimore, like Johns Hopkins. Um, and they're also a great institution. Uh, so the, the quality of care does matter quite a bit. Um, another lesson is if a doctor keeps changing diagnosis, Right away, you should seek a second opinion about your case because to me, the change of diagnosis without saying, I don't know what's going on and you should look somewhere else. It's a sign that somebody is spinning their wheels without ever landing on a, on, on a proper solution. Um, so that's a sign to get a second opinion. And if you are at all unhappy or uneasy or have a doubt, any doubt in your mind about the diagnosis. And if it's something that can impact the rest of your life, you should seek a second opinion and do not take no for an answer. Actually, the doctor who saw you the first time when you want a second opinion, legally, I don't think they're allowed to say no. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I cannot give you legal advice and verify in your state how those things work. But I think the doctor would say no to a second opinion and would be in very uh, deep doo-doo um, legally uh, if it turns out that your case is, is worse than he thought. Um, so if you're unhappy with the diagnosis you, you get, or if you get a diagnosis that you think there's some things that don't fit in your mind with your medical history or the results you're, you're seeing, and the doctor says, well, it must be this, and, and he ignores something, seek a second opinion. Uh, I would say the second opinion in my case did save my life. Um, so uh, those are the, the, the general lessons I learned uh, through this process. And I'm going to have more lessons learned in the, the future episodes. So this is just the introduction. Uh, you know, I have a primary sinus lymphoma. We, we dealt with it. Right now we think it's not going to come back, but we never know. I'm, I have to be on, on um, I have to receive MRIs uh, periodically. And right now it's every three months. Uh, eventually it's going to be at a lesser frequency and I think at, uh, at the lowest frequency is going to be once a year that I'm going to have an MRI to make sure that the damn thing doesn't come back because unfortunately it can come back uh, but I'm trying to be helpful uh, to my uh, fellow patients or people who are interested while I can and uh, right now I can be helpful so that's why I'm producing uh, these videos so with this I'm going to end uh, my introduction and uh, say goodbye and uh, see you uh, in the next episode or in, if you want to watch other videos in this channel you're more than, more than welcome so uh, goodbye